Oh. Sorry. Hello. I hope everyone's feeling refreshed after your break. Um, I'm here to talk about empowering young voices and why it's so important that we encourage them and nurture them to write. Um, I wanted to do a little warm up um, to help me more than anything else. And just, I just wanted to ask everyone here just to have a think to yourselves uh, about three words that sum up how you're feeling right now. Um, so just take a second, think of three words. I'm not going to embarrass anyone by asking them to tell me what their three words. I'll embarrass myself um, by sharing my three words with you. So um, when I got first asked to do a TED talk, um, it put the absolute fear in me. And I, I, I don't know why I said yes. I think I said yes because a voice said challenge yourself. Um, so um, my first word of how I'm feeling right now is, is scared. Um, now, as today grew ever closer, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which isn't necessarily the best thing, um, and the panic this morning led to me missing breakfast, and I also missed lunch. Um, so right now, <laughs> I'm feeling extremely hungry. Um, now, uh, it's amazing. We do this warm-up with children in the workshops that we do, and I would say probably the most common thing that children seem to say is hungry, um, which is, you know, bizarre. But the next thing that they say is excited. And, and I love that because we're going into a school to do a workshop, and they're excited about writing. And for me, what a great starting point because the fact that they... They want to share their words and their stories with us is amazing. So the, the next thing that we do in the, in the workshops is we ask the children to come up and give us a list of ingredients of what makes a great story. And this is really just to get their minds firing and, and, and get some inspiration going. So this time I do need some help. Um, so I just want to ask in the audience, could anyone um, give me a great ingredient for what makes a good story? Anyone? Pardon? Mystery, brilliant. Anyone else got a great ingredient for that will make a great story? Conflict. Okay, these are brilliant. In our primary school workshops, um, often the first thing that we get from children is... <laughs> now, there's no denying that punctuation can be in a good story, but it doesn't necessarily make a great story. Um, so we always ask for more. <laughs> okay, so, yes, let's say they are essential for a story. But we really want to know what makes a great story. <laughs> now, I'm sure there's some people in the audience here who don't actually know what a fronted adverbial is. Please don't worry that you don't know what a fronted adverbial is. Now, they can be in a great story. But again, they don't make a great story. What makes a great story is imagination. And primary school children in particular have that in abundance. And we need to celebrate that and we really need to nurture it too. When I was at art school, um, a teacher said to me that every child can draw. And as a parent, I have my children's drawings on the fridge wall, as I'm sure many other parents do as well, because their drawings are amazing. And they're amazing up to a point where someone says, that's not right. And then suddenly that child feels that they can't draw anymore. And for me, that is tragic. And the same can go for imagination. And so at the Bank of Dreams and Nightmares, what, oh, sorry, I'll move the quote off. At the Bank of Dreams and Nightmares, what we want to do is nurture that imagination, cherish it, and make it explode in the world. Um, because it's not just about writing. This is, this is about well-being. This is about self-belief. And, and through this, you know, we, writing can give children agency. And that's really important to us. And there's, you know, within the school system, the curriculum as it stands at the moment can sometimes constrain creativity. It, it doesn't necessarily celebrate it. And I'm not here to put a downer on the school system. I'm not an expert enough to sort of say why the education system might be failing in, in, in certain ways. 
I, I, I think teachers do the most amazing job, and I think that even more so since going into schools. There's often, you know, overworked and under-resourced, and, and what we try and do is help them. We want to give them all the help that we can to just really get our children to fire on all cylinders. So when we go into school, we say, we are not school. We don't care about punctuation. We don't care about how you're spelling. We definitely don't care about fronted adverbials. What we really care about is their imagination and their stories. And it's our job to try and nurture that and get it out of them. And so if we can just throw the rule book, rule book out for two hours when we go in a workshop and just have fun and let them explore wherever they want to go. And the hardest thing for us is not telling them where they should go. Because with story making, we think we know how a story should develop. But actually, we found if you hold back and you don't guide the children, They'll take, a, they'll take you on the most incredible journeys you'd never even thought could possibly work. So I'm going to share with you just quickly. This is um, uh, a story that we did in primary school. I'm just going to read you the beginning. Um, just, just as a little departure. Um, so this story is called Theo the Great. Many moons ago, there was an alien called Theo. He was a red alien, and he was covered in yellow spots. He had eight eyes and slimy arms. Theo lived on Mars. He was a very stubborn alien, and he wished he had a flying saucer. He wanted the flying saucer to fly to Earth. Theo climbed a tree and grabbed what he thought was a stick. But it was a python, and he fell. Now, the story carries on from that, um, and what we do in the workshops is the class as a group collaboratively come up with this story up to the cliffhanger moment. Cliffhanger is a great ingredient for a story, just, just in case you ever get asked the same question. Um, and we have an illustrator who live illustrates the story as the children are creating it. And then we go away and we take the, story, the children's story and the pictures and we print and bind their stories into books and we do it very professionally and um, the next day when we deliver these books to the children it's incredible the reaction you get um, they are published authors and you can see it on their faces that they see that we've taken them seriously and the pride that they take in their work and the reactions that we get back from both parents and teachers saying that children who wouldn't normally have engaged in writing are suddenly doing something makes, for me, the whole thing you know, incredibly worthwhile. Now, we don't just do that. We don't stop there. We want to do more. So we work um, in secondary schools on longer projects. And what we do with all the workshops is we try and create real-world outcomes. And what I mean by that is we publish short stories that children have written. We're creating a quarterly printed newspaper. We record podcasts with the children and publish them on a SoundCloud page. Um, we're making um, sketch comedies at the moment, and we're working with the BBC, and we will be filming the sketches that the children write with professional actors, and they'll be broadcast. And all of this has a purpose. We want to blow those children's minds. We want them to realize what's possible out there, and that we do take them seriously. And if we can do that, it really can be truly transformational. Now, for me, I've been, prior to doing this, I worked for 30 years uh, in film production, making TV commercials, music videos, feature films. Um, and that all started when I was at art college and a friend who worked at a record company said to me, oh, you're, you're at art college, could you make me a music video for a band that we're working with for no money? Um, so I clearly said, yes, I'd love to make a music video for no money. Um, and we did. And it got played on MTV, on the telly. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind that something that we did, we made for no money, just a few friends, was now on TV. And that was the catalyst for me and my career in film production for the next 30 years. And I want to give children from any backgrounds that same opportunity and that same chance to have their minds blown by something 
that they get to see that is taken seriously that they've created. And it doesn't just have, have to happen once. Um, I was in film production and I was on a job in San Francisco and, um, oh, let me get rid of Thea. And uh, I was, had a bit of time off and I stumbled across a pirate supply store. Now, this really was a pirate supply store. It's a shop for pirates. Um, it's where you go to buy your peg leg, your parrot food. Um, they've even got a lovely area in there where there's a fish tank behind some curtains in a dark room and it's therapy for landlocked pirates. Um, and I went to the counter to pay for my treasure map and uh, just had to ask them, what, I don't quite understand, what is this place? And they explained to me that at the back of the shop, behind a secret door, there's a creative writing centre for children. And again, for the next time, I was totally blown away. Um, and I then spent the next seven years trying to work out how I can set something up like this at home. Now, obviously, it's very hard to quit your job of such a long period of time. And I think it's only human nature. You try and put it off however you can. So I did manage to come up with ways to put it off and put it off and put it off. And then the pandemic hit. And like many other um, parents, I found that I was uh, homeschooling. I have two young boys. Um, and I absolutely loved it, first lockdown, because I was forced to find stuff to do with the kids. And the schools hadn't really, no one was really prepared in the first lockdown. So at least we were left pretty much to our own devices. And we had a lot of fun. And the boys really engaged. And then the second lockdown came round. And by this time, the system had caught up. So we were given work by the schools. And it was both a blessing and a curse. I suddenly didn't have to do it myself. But the problem was the curriculum-based material that we were getting was less inspiring. And my two boys were less engaged. So it ended up being harder work for me because they just didn't want to do it. And it wasn't just me. So for me, it was a light bulb moment on just how important creative writing for children is and, and why we need to cherish it. And it wasn't just me who, who had this thing. This is a, a quote, I have to quickly just read this here, from the National Literary Tr Trust in 2021. Um, they say, listening to children's experience of writing during the first lockdown in spring 2020, it became clear that for many, it had been a time of increased creativity with children writing everything from songs and stories to scripts, and some even beginning their own novels. Another prominent theme in our research last summer was that having more time to write freely had increased children's enjoyment of writing. In August 2020, uh, my mum, my mum, um, sadly passed away due to dementia and um, she left me a, a little bit of money as part of the inheritance, and I wanted to do something with it. I, didn't, I, I wanted to do something that would make her feel proud. So this was the point when I decided now's the time to quit my job and set up the charity because I couldn't think of a better way to make my mum proud um, with what I was doing. So um, in January 2021, um, the Bank of Dreams and Nightmares was created. Um, we've been running for about uh, nearly two years, um, working with schools and out of school programs and holiday clubs. Um, we have an amazing team of volunteers who we work with who do one to one mentoring with the children in all our sessions. Um, and we're a real bank, but we're a bank for stories. Our currency is stories, not, 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 not money. Um, and you know, when we finally get our home, which we will get soon, um, there'll be a secret door at the back of our bank. And if the children know where to go, they'll find the secret door. Um, so we're currently trying to find, this is some of our, our, our after school club outside, funnily enough, the bank in Bridport, which we've got our eyes on. Um, it was actually the inspiration for the whole idea um, because it's got vaults in there and they'd be brilliant for putting stories in. So we are going to, uh, at some point, try and buy the bank, but that's a whole other story for another time. But when we do, I've got big aspirations. I have dreams and nightmares um, for where this charity can go, but 
you know, we want to eventually, maybe we can become a bank that has children internationally depositing and withdrawing stories and sharing their stories with other children from around the world because we can learn so much from the children. Um, and it's really important. And I'm really excited. Last, last week, I was at a conference in London where there was seven similar creative writing charities from around the UK and Ireland all met to share ideas and method methodologies. And it felt like a bit of a movement. It felt like in the room there was joy, firstly, the joy of trying to encourage and, and celebrate children's words, but also that maybe we can do something. Maybe we can help add creativity a bit more to the, to the curriculum, show that it is important. I mean, next year we're having a worldwide conference and there's 40 creative charities from around the world all meeting in Edinburgh, again, to share ideas and to help and to try and do something that can make a change. So... Obviously, I'm passionate about trying to... All of this was new to me, and, and I didn't even think that children would be that excited by writing. And I'm so pleased that I was incredibly wrong. And I'm just going to leave you quickly with... Um, a, it's a bit of a case study from one of our workshops. Um, you know, we had a year four pupil who's been mute throughout his entire school life. He's only spoken in front of you know, one trusted member of staff. And after almost two years of careful interventions and relationship building in our first session, he chose to share an idea with one of our story mentor volunteers, which was then developed through consequent sessions. And the pupil's teacher noted, I just quote, this to me speaks volumes about how keen he was to share, how comfortable he was in the situation and how engaged he was in the process. He is a pupil with incredibly high anxiety, particularly around speaking, and the fact that he chose to share of his own accord is really, truly incredible. Thank you. <laughs>